On uh, January 1st of this year, it was um, one of the most beautiful days I remember in, uh, in this year. It was a clear blue day and, <clears throat> excuse me, I was out paddling, as I do. And uh, I was alone. It was uh, pretty cold out, mid-30s, I believe. I'd been out for uh, about four hours. And uh, off in the distance, uh, I saw something quite exciting. I saw a pod of orca whales. If you're, uh, if you're into whales, it was the T-137 pod, transient group. And uh, so I stopped and I, I hung out. I thought, I'm going to watch this for a while. This looks like a good time. And um, so I did. And as I, as I watched and saw what they were doing playing, they began to change their direction a bit and started to kind of come more my way. Got my attention. <laughs> so I hung out and, and watched. and. Um, then I noticed a, a couple of hundred meters ahead of the pod, the male orca began to, to get ahead of the group, and he was rising above the water quite a bit, and he was moving quite slowly. And uh, till, um, after several minutes had passed, eventually he was about as far as this back row is from me. So I paid attention, even more so now. And, um, and as he rose, as this giant dorsal fin rose, and this is a male, so his dorsal fin is almost as tall as I am. He comes up very slowly, and his body breaks the surface, and just as it breaks, he breathes, and then he stops. He's not swimming anymore. He's stopped, and his fin is completely out of the water. And then the fin rotates. I become acutely aware at this moment that not only am I aware of him, <laughs> but he is also aware of me. At which time I go ahead and sit my things down and take a knee. And as excited as this moment as I was, for, for this moment as I was, and as, as prepared as I thought I was, there was a whole host of f fight or flight options going on <laughs> through my system. I, I was alone. I was a mile and a half from the nearest shore. and. Uh, at this point, I had nothing to do but deal with whatever was about to happen. There were no exit strategies, even though the body was telling me it was, so all that's going on. So sure enough, uh, three seconds was really about one, and said orca shows up right at my doorstep. And then right behind him comes the rest of the pod. It's about seven or eight of them together. And they said, hey, let's go see what this guy's doing. So <laughs> over they came, and, and they're rolling, and they're jumping, and they're swimming under me, and they're, and they're coming up, and there's a baby in the group as well. And uh, I, 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 could, I didn't, but I could have touched them. They were right there. And, uh, and this goes on and on for about, to, about 20 minutes or so. They're jumping. They're doing the whole show. They're slapping the water. The male launches himself out of the water right next to my board, splashes. I mean, full, you know, I'm riding the wake from this getting wet. And uh, well, and the thing I remember, the, the thing that still sticks in my head uh, of all this visual sensory that was going on and the fear that was going on was the, the sound the sound that these males, these whales made as they, as they swam around me. I tell you, you can't tell, but I do have hair standing up. <laughs> so, it still shakes me to the bone. They would come to look at me, and we'd make eye contact. To think that an animal that big is looking at you and thinking about you while you're thinking about it, it's a pretty unique experience. Now, I'm not the only guy in the world who's, who's been close to orcas. It's as long as man and orca have come together near the water, they've checked each other out. But I think what does make this story a little bit unique is where it happened. Because it happened about five miles from where you're sitting right now. I think that's kind of special. You don't get to live in a city every day and drive out your back door and, and get in the water and have that kind of experience. So, Tacoma. Let's talk about that. Where are we? Well, a lot of people don't know, you do, but this thing is televised around the world, so let's talk about that. Washington State, top right corner. So uh, if you're out there in internet land, we're way, way up there. And uh, if you zoom in a little closer, this is Puget Sound. And uh, there we are, we're down in the South Sound section there. And we sit as a city on about 21 miles of shoreline. And as it, as it pertains to access to the water, how we can get to the water, 
do a real quick definition here. There's our boundary lines, north and south boundary lines. And uh, about half a mile in the northern part of the, our boundary is uh, accessible uh, by, you can you know, walk to it. And then about uh, two and a half miles of that is private residential. That also accounts for, um, on the west side over there, um, Salmon Beach residence area. About three and a half miles of that is port entry related. About five miles of it's just geographically inaccessible. It's cliffs and rugged shoreline. Another half mile in the southern boundary is uh, also pedestrian accessible. And then about nine miles on what I jokingly call the North Shore of Tacoma. Um, <laughs> that's, our, that's kind of our premier, our premier real estate there. So Now, Tacoma's got kind of an interesting history as it pertains to the water and what, what makes this, this story special. We're a 139-year-old city. We're not very old, to be quite honest. Um, and our expression as a city against these shorelines for over 100 years was very heavily industrialized. We kind of had just carte blanche run at this thing. We were making money and burning stuff and making stuff, and we had great big, deep, dark, cold water to kind of hide our sins. So that was really how we lived for a long time. Places like this, if you're a local here, you might recognize this. Um, some called this Mordor. Um, <laughs> we also uh, called it the smelter, and um, actually, uh, I was going to say that Mordor was modeled after the smelter, but I, well, one way or the other, they were kind of one and the same. Very awful. A lot of bad stuff came out of that for a very, very long time, and it really changed the identity of, of what happens in our waters here. And so scenes like this were, were kind of the norm, you know, a lot of just, eh, going on. Now, I, uh, I work in sports, and so I look at things like economic development and vitality of sports and kind of look at sports as a barometer. Sports kind of reflect on a, on a healthy city. And um, you know, by way of sports and the water, Commencement Bay was kind of a, kind of had a canary in the coal mine situation. And if, if that language isn't familiar to you, back in the old days, uh, in the mines, they would take a canary in a cage down in the mine, and if the air became toxic, the canary would die. And that was generally a good signal that the miners should go ahead and exit, <laughs> exit the mine. Bad things were coming. Well, by way of sports, Commencement Bay was full of dead canaries. Okay? We weren't um, really the kind of place you'd think about dipping your toes in the water or going for a paddle or those kind of habits. It just wasn't there. So by 1983, as a result of that, uh, Commencement Bay was uh, designated a Superfund site. And you have to make an awful mess of things to get on that list. And we were about, about fourth, so like one step off the podium, if you would. Um, not, not a great place to be. So. Um, so that was just 1983. That wasn't very long ago, really. You know, so we kind of started this new way of thinking a little bit and kind of decommissioning some things and changing the way we were making things and polluting things and stuff like that. And, and we, we began into this, this kind of metamorphosis, this new transition into this new, new way of living as a city against the shoreline. Now, pay attention to this photo before I change it real quick here. Uh, the building in that picture no longer exists. If you are local, that is what is now Theus Park. The building in the background next to it is, um, is a business office now. It, it still exists. Uh, but uh, that aircraft carrier, actually, in this photo, at the moment that that was taken, was here to power the city. Uh, the city had some kind of power grid problem, so they brought an aircraft carrier and plugged it into the wall, and everybody had lights. <laughs> now, <laughs> when you're in a hurry, you don't ask questions. So, um, to be, <laughs> Now, so take a look there at the anchor, uh, anchor chain coming out of that, and let's fast forward to right now, and look, that paddler is right where that anchor chain was. That's kind of cool. That's a big change. It certainly doesn't look the same as it did then. I, I say that's reflective of, uh, of something new going on. So that's what we start to see. We start to see this change. And this change here, where we're starting to see people put a paddle in the water and get close to the water and use the water for something a little different, this is, this is new. This is like... 20 years old, 15 years old. And that's kind of where, where this starts to really take root. I mean, people were paddling before that. Don't test me, I know. But, but in, in mass, you know, really starting to change this identity. Uh, they were not paddling when that aircraft carrier was sitting there. And they weren't doing that when a Sarko was uh, doing their thing very much. So it's a little bit different feel. Look at that. That is where the smelter was. Again, not the kind of thinking you would have seen to, to set that up back then. Outrigger canoes out in the bay. beach along Ruston Way there. All those paddle craft sitting there and they're having an event. Look at this kid, barefooted, running through the sand. 
<laughs> Again, just, we just didn't have the table set for that kind of ideology back, back in those days. So all these vibrant pictures, these are very current pictures of, of uh, different events and, and activities happening in, in our relation to this city here. And it's just such a different attitude than we've known before. And that's really the core of this message today. It's about awareness. We're only like, if, if you took, took the timeline of the, of the city and then you kind of gave it a number to where we're at right now, like 13% of our time has allowed for this kind of expression in living with our water. And it's that kind of expression that allows some guy like me to get involved in a sport and go out and have one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I would dare say of yours if you had it as well, where you can go five miles from here out in the water and have direct contact with a pot of orcas. Did you know? <laughs> I hear that all the time. People go, I had no idea. I didn't know. Now you do. Thank you.